Thank you. Hey, everybody. Oh, good. The, well, I can hear myself. It's scary. Uh, if you didn't spot the program, the, the goal with this talk is to show you that continuous integration is not hard to set up. Uh, in 25 minutes, I'm going to walk through uh, setting up a very simple little project because all of mine already have continuous integration. Uh, and I'm going to use two services. One of them is uh, Travis CI. Travis CI is a host, fully hosted service. Um, and then to go completely the other direction is Jenkins, which is a self-hosted service. Uh, and uh, I will talk about some others, but these are the two that I use at Talkbox, so they're the ones I feel comfortable uh, showing you all. And of course, there will be plenty of time for questions. OK, the problem. What, what does continuous integration solve? Uh, if you don't have continuous integration, how do you know that the code in your source repository is ready to ship? Do you have a manual checklist that you go through? Uh, are you always perfect at following it? Are all of your developers perfect at checking that the project runs before they hit commit? Continuous integration is the answer to this. Uh, who here is already using continuous integration? Also, uh, who here doesn't know what continuous integration is? That, that makes my life way easier. Uh, I can skip through some slides. Um, obviously, I'm just going to go with it anyway. Uh, Continuous integration is both a practice and servers. Uh, we're here to talk about using servers to do it for you. Uh, you can go through the approach of running tests or just building your code on every single commit. Uh, that's if you just let people commit to your master branch. Uh, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, I am going to use Git and GitHub for everything in this talk. Uh, is there anyone here who doesn't know Git? Great. Uh, branches. Awesome. Uh, I will use branches. Uh, when I use the word fork in this context, uh, just just. For completeness, uh, forking is where you create your own copy of a repo. You have all of the history from the original repository, but any changes are unique to your fork, and you can submit a pull request or apply patches to merge your code back into that original repository. Pull requests. Who here uses pull requests? Awesome. You are my people. Um, if you don't, pull requests are, uh, in the GitHub world at least, uh, the way that you say to the, mass, uh, to the kind of target repository, here, I have some code changes, please apply those. And the great thing is, GitHub makes the pull request point a great place to gate changes to your code to make sure they've been reviewed by someone else, if you turn that on and that the, any checks that you want to run through any continuous integration service run and pass before the code lands in your main repository. Uh, at Talkbox, we use the fork branch submit pull request workflow. Uh, as a developer, I have forks of most of the repositories in the company. It's the nature of my job. And whenever I want to make changes, I create a branch in my repository make those changes, submit a pull request, wait for all the checks to pass. And then someone else kindly merges it for me because you know, even, even the senior people don't get to merge our own code. Uh, like I said, I need a simple, very simple project. So let's walk through making one of those in Xcode. Um, starting with a, a nice blank slate. I'm going to need Xcode. Uh, 
Like I said, very, very simple application. Uh, by using screenshots, Xcode can't crash on me. Um, and it's not, it's not even a beta of Xcode. Uh, I'm going to use a single, single view application. Uh, Swift, because everyone loves Swift. Storyboards, because what could go wrong? And, and turning on unit tests and UI tests. Uh, if you've already got a project and you want to add unit tests and UI tests, that's something I don't know a lot about, so you'll need to jump on Google. Thanks, Xcode. Good work. This code is tiny, but the actual code really isn't important. Uh, I've added a little struct that lets me add and subtract numbers. Uh, and, okay, how about a test? Uh, Again, tiny text. Uh, the important part is I have a test that says that the add and subtract methods work. And I'm also using the performance testing because I want to show that later on. OK. I can run these tests locally on my machine by going up to the product menu and hitting test. Or I can hit command U. And that's great. I get these little green check marks, which are actually hard to see still on the screen. That's perfect as long as I always remember to run them. And I'm not perfect. I doubt any of us are. So I need some way to make sure that these are always passing. Quick diversion. Uh, if you have never used the Xcode bu uh, build command to build your code on a machine where you haven't already opened the project in Xcode, you need to mark any schemes that it will use as shared. Uh, Xcode automatically creates these schemes for you, but it creates them on the fly when you open Xcode. Uh, so, uh, where this button is? Yeah, a little shared checkbox does the trick. All right. So this project needs a GitHub repository, so I'm going to make one. Uh, the code is up on GitHub at the repository name. It will be linked uh, at the end from a, one of the slides. Uh, it's a public repository. And it's empty. So Xcode conveniently created a Git repository on my machine when I created this project. So I just need to tell, uh, tell the Git on my machine where to send these things to up on GitHub. Uh, and, okay, I've made some changes since the project was created. You can see the, the tests uh, and the, the scheme. So I'm just going to create that. I'm going to push it up to master. This is the last commit I'm going to send to master. And, okay. Uh, as I said, at Topbox, we use the forking. We, we fork every repo and submit pull requests across uh, repos. Uh, for the purposes of demo, I'm going to use a single repository and do a pull request between branches. Uh, it basically works exactly the same. So, setting up CI is hard, right? This is how we do it on GitHub. You sign in, uh, sorry, on Travis CI. You sign in with your GitHub credentials. If you're not using GitHub, sorry. Um, tra uh, Jenkins coming up later can help you. Build Kite, I'll, I'll talk about the others later. Uh, we sign in, and then the really complicated process of turning on Travis for a repository is covered here. Oops, no. There you go. Click the little plus button up in the corner. Uh, it's going to list all my repositories. There's my dev world one. I turn it on. That's almost all you have to do to get it working. Uh, I'm going to also only do it if the Travis YAML file is present. The Travis YAML file tells Travis exactly how to build uh, or what to do to build and test your code. Uh, and I want to tweak it, so I'm going to turn that on. This is a Travis YAML file. Uh, if you're not used to YAML, it's kind of key colon value. Um, and the last line with the hyphen, you can have an array of, of items there. 
Uh, you tell Travis what language you want to test. So Travis works really well with a bunch of different programming languages. They support things on just running on Linux through Docker and on macOS. And they have images for all the versions of Xcode that you can probably need. And they even have the betas of Xcode. They lag the betas by a few days, but that's kind of understandable. You tell it which project to use, which scheme to use, which SDK you want to build with. And in this case, I'm overriding that stuff anyway so that I can pipe my output through XC Pretty. Uh, quick, quick diversion here. If you don't have tests already, and you need to fix that as well, you can still just build your project. Even knowing that your project is always in a state where it builds is super valuable. It saves your other, uh, your coworkers, or even yourself later on from working out, did I just break this or, or is it already broken? Hey. And everyone loves a screenshot of the dance that we all do with Git. And cool. So it's, it, that new Travis YAML file is up on GitHub in a new branch. And GitHub prompts us to do a pull request. Which hopefully it will do. Thank you. Or not. There we go. So and I, I should put a nice message there, but. Okay, hooray, a test passed already. Uh, it actually runs twice because I'm running it within the same repo. When you're doing this across repos, you'd just see the PR. And that one passes. Hooray, we're all good. Thankfully, those tests I wrote were working. If we click on the show all checks <laughs> item, we can see the individual checks. Those are still accessible to you even after the pull request is merged, so you can go back and check that the tests ran. And you can see the log output on Travis. And right at the bottom, unfortunately hard to see, there are my tests. And the performance one ran and measured everything in the right amount of time. So now the tests are running on PRs. How can we make sure that the tests really are passing and that you know we haven't screwed anything up. So I am going to uh, enable protected branches. Uh, protected branches, let's just go into the branches section in options. Uh, choose your branch. And then we just protect this branch. Uh, require status checks before merging. The, Pull request review is the other one that we do at Topbox. It requires someone other than the person who submitted the PR to review it and say the code is okay first. And that's all. Uh, so let's, let's make a quick change that will purposefully break, break the test. Uh, let's just add the number one to every add command. What, what could possibly go wrong? Yeah, submit a, submit a PR. You don't need to see that again. All right, cool. The tests are running. Oh, no. Surprise, surprise, the tests actually failed. If we click through on the details, we can see exactly where the test failed. And this is pretty similar to the output you'd see with the next code itself. So that was Travis CI. Now, I use travisci.org for this demo. Travisci.org is free for public repositories on GitHub. Uh, if you are like many of us, you have repositories that are private. Travisci.com is the answer for that. You pay based on the number of concurrent builds you want to allow. Uh, you might think that's one, uh, but if you are doing any kind of fancy application development where you build multiple things. Uh, let's say you have a JavaScript project and you want to test in multiple browsers. You might set it up so that it builds three or four things at once. Jenkins. Jenkins is the next way that I'm going to show you how to do continuous integration. 
Jenkins gets a heck of a lot of hate. A lot of hate. It gets hate because it's Java, and Java gets a lot of hate as well. It is often seen as clunky and slow and hard to configure. And okay, a lot of that is actually a little bit fair, but you don't have to do things the hard way with Jenkins. For example, I'm running Jenkins, ran Jenkins locally on my laptop. Uh, the simplest way to get started is to just run it with, a doc uh, with Docker, using the, the command at the top there. It's all on the Jenkins website, uh, thankfully. Uh, there are packages available for installing it on a Mac or on a Windows machine or Linux. Uh, at Talkbox, we run it in EC2 because running things on bare metal is horrible. Um, so yeah, you just run that command, wait a couple of minutes, and then you get prompted to customize Jenkins, which I'm not going to do. You will spend maybe five to ten minutes looking at the screen, depending on how terrible your hotel Wi-Fi is. I wish we had the NBN. And then it will tell you it's ready, and that's great. And this is the last time you see this nice install UI, unfortunately. This is regular Jenkins. It's completely empty. It can run jobs inside the Jenkins container, but that's Linux in this case, inside Docker. And I need to get this to work on uh, building Xcode projects on my Mac. So it turns out that's not terribly difficult. We just create a new node, give it a name. Uh, if you are using, you can install plugins and then Jenkins can spin up EC2 instances for you or other cloud platforms. Uh, that's what we do. I didn't bother for this, and I don't know how that would work with Xcode builds anyway. Uh, I'm creating a label uh, that describes this particular build machine. When you are configuring jobs, or as I show later, a Jenkins file, uh, you can tell it what label to run things on, and that way, if you have a mixture of machines running iOS, uh, Mac builds, maybe you have different versions of Xcode installed in different places, it becomes easy to target things. Okay, we've created our, our node or agent. Uh, Jenkins has a bunch of words to describe this. Uh, the jar that you install is slave.jar. I don't love that naming, but it is unfortunately what it is. So we need to run that command. And unless you're uh, doing Java development or Android development, you'll probably get presented with the lovely no Java runtime present. I've owned this computer for a year, and I didn't have Java on it. So you get to look at that page, <laughs> which I skipped over nice and fast, so I don't want to scar anybody. And then you simply run the, the agent. Uh, as, yay, our, our agent is online. Again, I don't know why they mix the word node and agent. So we need to create a project uh, inside Jenkins. Um, the freestyle project up at the top is probably the one that most people are familiar with. It pretty much lets you do anything you want. You put in a shell script and run stuff, or you install plugins that make it run Xcode build, or if you're on the Java Android side, then there's a Gradle plugin so that you don't even really do anything. You just say, hey, run the Gradle stuff, please. But I'm going to use the multi-branch pipeline plugin. It's relatively new, but it lets you describe your Jenkins configuration in your repository, which means that all the changes that might be made to it are kept inside your code base with the code that it's uh, building. So do that. And that's pretty much as simple as giving it a name Giving it credentials for GitHub, you'll want it to be probably a different user than yourself. Uh, and you, it, now, it needs to have write access to your repository because it will set the status items for you uh, on the pull request. Uh, and then once you type in the owner, the owner is a user or an organization name, it will populate the repository list. Uh, yeah, actually, I forgot this. 
uh, also kind of relies on GitHub. So if you're using thing, other things, then you'll need to use one of the other plugins, like the Freestyle one, uh, which does happily work with Git from anywhere, Subversion, CVS, if anyone's still using that. And click Save. And it goes through and it scans my repository, looks at all the branches, and sees that none of them has a Jenkins file yet. So let's make one of those. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, Jenkins files are written in Groovy, if you're used to that. Uh, if you're not, you can kind of pretend that it's a programming language at all. Uh, but it is, and you can use it like one. So you can, things will return things. I'm not showing them in any of them here. But your build artifacts will return values that you can then use later on, even if they're on a different node. Here, we have to explicitly tell it to check out the source code and then run the Xcode build command. It's the same, except no XC pretty this time. Hey, we'll do the branching and pull request dance again. And it shows up here. And it shows up in the same way as the Travis ones do. No pretty icon, unfortunately. I could probably set that up for that user. And yay, the test pass. If we jump into details, it shows the Jenkins UI. Each one of those uh, stage blocks from the Jenkins file show up as a column in this table. Uh, those stage blocks support parallel, uh, parallelization, so you can run things across multiple nodes at once. Say you have a single repo that has code that runs across Android and iOS. Uh, that's super trivial to do with Jenkins. It's also super easy to make uh, stages build and then test on separate machines and environments, all kinds of fun stuff. If we click through, we can see the, de uh, the logs from our test run. It's much harder to read because it's all black, unfortunately. Uh, but right up here is our executed three tests with zero failures. There are others, as I said. Uh, the first one I'm going to mention, it's entirely alphabetical order, not really, uh, is BuildKite. BuildKite is really popular with people at DevWorld. Uh, it's, as I understand it, a hybrid where, the, where Jenkins, you run the master and everything on your environment. BuildKite, the, like the master lives up in the cloud, but you run your own build agents on your hardware. Uh, if I'm wrong, hopefully someone will correct me and... I can say, hey, talk to that person. Circle CI, they have some big names. I don't know how much they actually use them. And Atlassian have one called Bamboo. It probably integrates really well with the Bitbucket and Jira and Confluence environment. But Topbox uses uh, Confluence and Jira extensively. And we have good integration already. With, uh, with Jenkins and GitHub, so it doesn't buy us anything, but it's there. Uh, and I guess my one last message is, uh, whatever, whatever you do, use source control. And we're done. Um, I will take questions, but uh, afterwards the slide and the GitHub repository will be linked from there, probably for like 10 minutes after the talk. Uh, reach out to me on Twitter. I'm on a bunch of different Slacks, and I, I probably read email, I don't know. Uh, any questions? Yes, you. Uh, so what's the main difference you do for request between port thrust and port thrust between branches, workflow-wise? Um, so the question was, what's the main difference between doing a pull request between forks versus branches? Practically speaking, there isn't. The, the, the advantage of doing it across forks is access control. Uh, so we don't. We tend to give everyone right access uh, and then rely on our status checks and our code review process. But for some repositories, yeah, we make it so that it's the main repository is read-only. So if anyone wants to contribute, they have to fork. Uh, 
but it, especially if, you, if you're only one person, forking would be massive overkill. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just a question about JLB is there any other way, like what is your say for the iOS test? I'm not sure, sorry. I, actually, I, uh, can you repeat the question so I can repeat just, it? Just a question about JLB. Yeah. Uh, So the, the question was, uh, in, in the Jenkins setup when I was starting the agent, uh, I went with the running, uh, the uh, using web start. So using the java slash jar command. If I can find it again. Uh, so this one. Uh, the alternative, one of the alternatives that uh, Jenkins support is having the Jenkins master SSH into your, into your build agents and starting the, the slave.jar that way. Uh, likewise, I haven't found that to work. Uh, Xcode build, especially if you are using the keychain and um, so that you can build for, with sign, uh, code signing, uh, really likes to have an interactive session. So yeah, I, I have found the Java jar way to work better. I never do it this way. <laughs> Um, I always set up a launchd job in the users library slash launch agents folder. Um, yeah, it just it plays better. You still have to deal with unlocking the keychain, but that's that's way outside of the scope of this talk. You can do it from the command line. The the only problem is that, that they relock after a period of time of interactivity. That's the the keychain. Um, so you have to do it really quickly. <laughs> but, sure. There was another question. So, yes. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, UI tests in your CI pipeline? The question is UI tests in the uh, in the CI pipeline. I'm not the right person to ask that. Unfortunately, uh, the code that I work on doesn't tend to have a UI. <laughs> uh, it's a library that other people build UIs with. Um, it is problematic, but if if you're using if you're using machines that are in a known configuration state, Travis CI is probably the better bet because it's in a known state all the time. Um, yeah, sorry. Have you looked at Xcode server and the bots and things like that? Is that is that The question is Xcode server. I, I haven't had particularly good luck with Xcode server, unfortunately. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't. It, I've tried to get it to work in the past and have it had issues. It likes to kind of own the, the source control and stuff. And that uh, lots of that stuff is changing in Xcode 9. So once that's out and we've had a chance to evaluate it, I'll probably feel differently. Um, if I guess for especially for Topbox, we are a we span a whole bunch of platforms, and so even our iOS stuff is built from a repository that has code for other, has C++ and C code that has to compile on a bunch of other places. So it becomes easier to just use Xcode build. Thank you very much.